Thanks. Um, I, I so want to be a millennial. It's, uh, it's, uh, my, my goal in life is to step back about, well, I won't tell you how many years, but uh, I want to be the kid that thinks that a 20-year-old knows more than he does, because I know all everybody uh, younger than me does. Um, I think it's really interesting that um, this conference is really about um, kind of one idea, and uh, it's about human-centered um, workplace. And every speaker that you've heard up here today that I witnessed talked about this idea of being connected to, um, to the humanity in the, in the workplace, rather than worrying uh, about the furniture. It is about the people in the process. Now, I'm, um, I, I want to tell you a little bit more about me before, before I go into this. I'm an industrial designer by training. Uh, when I was growing up and uh, uh, beginning to go to school, I wanted to work in the Charles Eames office. And so as I graduated from uh, college, I drove across country to, with a friend of mine to interview and to, be, to try to become a designer in the Charles Eames office. Uh, and um, I didn't get the job. Um, so part of that logic is that um, many years later, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, come to work at Herman Miller, and uh, needless to say, that was an easy decision for me because of the legacy of people like uh, uh, Charles Eames. There's a, there's a connection to what they do uh, as a company. Herman Miller is a company that believes in uh, deep understanding of, of people-centered uh, design. And I want to thank Jerry, actually. It's very rare, I'll, and I'll uh, sort of say this out loud, it's rare that one furniture company gives another furniture company credit for something. And uh, so I, I'm, I want to thank Jerry, and I, I'm not sure whether he's still here, but thank you for talking about the Aeron chair, because it is a, um, it's, it's iconographic for a way of change that happened at Herman Miller when, when it was launched and continues to go on today. So let's, let's begin talking about what is happening in the, uh, actually I wanna back up, let me stay there for a second. Um, you know, the, what's going on is the workforce is changing. I don't need to say that again. You've heard that at least six or seven times this morning, that the, the way people are working, the way uh, the tools are working, and just the interaction of people is changing in a dramatic way. Uh, we've been working with uh, significant experts in strategy, in research, in uh, human factors to begin to try to understand what the future is about. And I loved the definition earlier this morning that nobody can foresee the future, that, um, that the idea of the future really remains in, uh, in the future, but we can target how we think about it so that we go to the immediate next step that makes things work. So we're trying to understand how people act and work in, the, in this new, uh, new land. But one of the ways we have to do that is to look back a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to uh, give you a little tour of the eras of change of the last 100 years. Now, uh, you know, the era of industry was where things were mass produced. There was an engagement with uh, material, uh, making things. It was mechanized. It, it became a way of thinking about uh, the world that was highly hi hierarchical. The uh, management systems uh, were, were built to be boss, uh, worker, lower worker, lower worker. It was not built as a uh, place where people uh, could interact in a way other than I'm the boss, you're the employee, go do what I tell you to do, right? So um, the offices of that period were the same thing. They were like the assembly lines. There were corner offices with big windows and fancy desks, and there were a bunch of desks pushed together in the back office to do the work. Um, the next era is the era of information, and that is a time when the capability of all of the data and the resources for the company allowed companies to go global. 
And so global workforce required a more matrix-driven organization and was um, organized really around using middle management as the managers off in the world. And uh, the workplace of that point uh, was the panel-based system, which allowed a huge amount of work and a huge number of workers to be uh, organized in a way to get this matrix-driven uh, work done. The, the tools were built for bigger systems, and the systems themselves began to be the problem. I, uh, I worked for Johnson & Johnson just prior to coming uh, to work at Herman Miller, and j and is an old line Fortune 500 company that had a system that for everything. When I joined the company and I was hired to be um, the chief design officer for the company, the first one of those that the company ever had, all design work prior to that was done by outside consulting firms and done at less integrated levels. The, the marketing person for Johnson's Baby Shampoo would hire one design firm and the person working at Neutrogena would hire another design firm, which meant there was no, no crossover. The biggest issue that I had joining the company was that I wanted to be, uh, have my team, which turned out to be about 150 people, I wanted to have my team on Macintosh computers. And the company said basically, and I was really glad I asked this question actually before I got hired, because I said to my boss, there are three things I need to do, uh, actually four. One is I need to work for you, because I don't want, you know, the design organization needs to work at, at the most senior level. The second thing was we need to be in New York City and separated from the marketing organization, which was all in New Jersey at the time. And the third thing was I need Macintosh computers. She said yes to the first two without even thinking. And the third one was, I'll have to get back to you. And it was because the systems in this era were built as monolithic, um, IT-based, uh, controlled, very uh, you know, organized systems to, to make uh, the company work, theoretically, uh, as, a, as a unit. The problem is the systems all got old, uh, nobody wanted to use them or update them, and the cost to replace them was so dramatic that it was problematic in the, in the process. So from that era, we go to the era of ideas, which is where we are now. We're on the cusp of this um, uh, development of a way of thinking and working uh, that is very different than the other two eras. The, the logic of this is that there is much more democratization among management, that the logic of what you work on might be de determined by you rather than determined by some mythical being called the boss, and that there is a more organic model of organization that allows networks and um, connected uh, groups of people to, to, to do the work together. Now, uh, we have in our world sort of ultimate connectivity. You know, it's, we're headed to a point where it is about being able to be connected with whoever you want to be connected with at any time. I love the story earlier about voicemail. That is so, I, my, when I change jobs, I don't even have a phone that is tied to Herman Miller. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. But the idea that um, people are networked in a very different way is, is what's going on. And it is only going to get uh, significantly more interesting. And I say that both from a good point of view and a, and a maybe not so good point of view. But we are, it, the world is getting more interesting in terms of how that, uh, how that works. No one has to work in a discrete location. And I'm a perfect example of that. I lived for a long time in New York City. I worked for Johnson & Johnson there. I made a decision that I wanted to live in LA and then ha happened to have a conversation with Ben Watson, who's my boss, who lives in New York, that I was in, that, you know, that maybe it would be interesting to, to come work for, for Herman Miller. But I said to him, I'm not, gonna, I'm not staying in New York, I'm moving to Los Angeles. Would that be okay with Herman Miller? And again, very quickly, yes, that's no problem because we're everywhere and in fact we need influence from different places. So I live in LA, my boss lives in New York, works in New York in a satellite office for Herman Miller, and Herman Miller, as you know, is based in West Michigan. 
and a very beautiful place, and I love, love visiting there, but I want to live somewhere else. And so the way we communicate and organize now uh, requires that we deal with people like me who, who want to be in, in different kinds of organization. We need to go from this kind of work, which is kind of, this is sort of funny picture because it's clearly bakers at Nabisco or something, but it's this idea of kind of mechanized, uh, you know, root, routinized kind of work. We need to go from that to this, which is much messier, uh, kind of more interesting in, in the way it's done, and driven by uh, the idea that collaboration is the way work gets done, and the way innovation gets done is with, is with this kind of collaboration. Now, I was telling you a few minutes ago about uh, the J&J &J, uh, facility that we, we built in New York City. It was designed to be a design center for the company, and it was designed to not uh, emulate, actually, any of the other places that J&J &J owned. J&J, &J, as I said earlier, conservative, hierarchical, old line Fortune 500 company. Um, and the managers, the senior managers of the group wanted to build an innovation center that would allow J&J &J to innovate in a different way. And they thought design was a good place to start. One of the things we did was we built something called the lab. And I'm sorry I don't have photographs of it. it, was, it it's, uh, they're pretty sensitive about showing it. But the idea of this lab was that it was a big empty space, actually much like this, where we fiddled around with how we worked. And we changed the nature of how we worked on a fairly regular basis because we were interested in how the interactions might work. That's the future of all place. It is going to be about this idea of uh, making changes to suit what people need to do, to be about how they think and how they work together, and to change the, the logic of, um, of what their uh, particular work is about. Um, now, you know, the, the, the idea of management and, uh, oh, I threw in this slide. This is the other place people are working. Uh, I, I, we, I was walking around yesterday. This is around the corner somewhere. I'm not quite sure where it is. But the idea of this is back here inside, there's a concierge. Oh, sorry, fell off the stage. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. We're lucky I only did that once. And actually, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very agile. Oh, I'm so not agile. Um, I'm so excited about this workplace thing. Uh, so, what's interesting, there's a concierge in the back. You go in, you sign up, you pay $2 an hour at a cafe to have a seat which has a connection, which has the ability for you to sit and work for as long as you want. And oh, by the way, on your computer, you can order a coffee or a sandwich, and it gets delivered to your assigned desk, two bucks an hour. And somebody told us about this, and I, on the way over there, I thought, eh, it's not gonna be that interesting. Um, it was very interesting, it was completely packed. There were people sitting, as you can see, sitting outside using it for free because it's okay to use it for free from outside, uh, use the connection. But it's a pretty, pretty impressive place. Um, I was also very happy to see uh, a Charles Eames lounge chair and two wooden DC, uh, DC chairs as well. So it was, it was, uh, it's a very interesting place. I encourage you to go look at it. People work from anywhere. Now, um, the idea of management and how we think about um, what management's role is. Management's role is about making sure that the lives of the people they are working with and the people who they are serving are uh, treated well. So the logic, you know, the logic used to be, we're only in it for the money, we're in it for the customer, we're not in it for the humanity. We think the future is about the humanity. And the, um, the idea um, that processes don't create ideas. Processes don't create ideas, and processes uh, don't have relationships. Many companies want to put all kinds of process in what they do, but the processes 
are not the valuable part. The people are the valuable part. They are better when they are serving um, the company in a way that's, that's comfortable and energized for them. And ideas are better generated in groups. Groups of people make better uh, logical decisions about what the, what the future of a business would be than individuals do buried in their private offices in the corners. So we're, we're trying to go from these kinds of tools, very traditional uh, logic, to these kinds of tools. Um, th this is Big Bang Theory. There was a, a segment on it about a 3D printer. The idea of creating um, whatever it is you want to today, right now, is really cool. Um, and I want to uh, use my J&J &J experience to tell you one more story about that. One of the things we did in that lab I told you about was we installed uh, two 3D printers. This was about seven years ago. And the day we installed the printers, the industrial designers went crazy. They began to make things in a way that was, uh, for the future of, of Johnson & Johnson, the right kind of logic. They were um, turned on by the idea that in about three hours, they could get a 3D thing. Whatever they wanted to make, they could make. And they started out by making bike helmets and uh, you know, uh, uh, action figures and all kinds of other craziness. But when they sort of settled down to use it as a tool, it became a tool like none other for the, for the company in that kind of way. It was a very powerful uh, uh, logic. The, um, the tools also have to be uh, kind of universal in their connection. You know, data now is ubiquitous. Uh, I'm not sure we're really connected to how data is going to get used in the future, but we're starting to see with uh, people like the seed media people who are, who are tracking uh, UN um, uh, data from every part of the world through cell phones uh, as a way of understanding what people need and want. So this idea of technology becoming intuitive and natural, I think, is really the future. One of the, uh, one of the ideas that we're working with is that technology needs to be like air. You know, we as, we as human beings, we breathe, we, the air is all around us, and we breathe, we don't think about it, we don't have to uh, work on any kind of uh, logic that says, I have to take a breath. Okay, I have to take another breath. It all is just there. Technology needs to be like air. It needs to just be there. It needs to connect when you walk in the room. It needs to be uh, about uh, how you are and how you work. Not that, oh my God, I can't figure out how to plug this in and do, do this and make it work. It needs to be ubiquitous. Now, um, we need to go from these kinds of places, uh, and you know we're guilty a little bit of, uh, of having um, made these kind of places. We take responsibility while we're trying to, we're working to make that better with all of you. Uh, but we need to go to these kinds of places. This is um, the coffee bar at the design yard at Herman Miller. And this is not a staged photograph where we said, okay, you sit over at that table and you sit at the coffee bar with your computer and you guys talk, send, talk in the back about some idea. This is how Herman Miller leadership now works. There are, uh, the, the entire space has been redesigned to make it a living office in a way that makes it functional for everybody. And oh, by the way, when it doesn't function, we change it. And that's kind of the journey we're on to make sure that we're thinking about how offices ought to work. So the, the, um, the logic of this is that working for a company doesn't require that you sit at a desk and look at a computer screen and not interact with anybody else. Interaction is key to what people need to do in their, in their workplace and in their lives. Now, the... Um, the, the next part of this really is <coughs> about making, and I, I'm, I'm going to use this word advisedly, but I think there is a connection to the way people want to work now. 
And that is that there's a spiritual connection, uh, not necessarily to uh, the kind of uh, overarching spiritual idea, but the idea of spirit in me and the way I work with people. That is the idea of what workplace needs to mean to people. And we have to have a naturally human experience. You know, it was interesting to hear the, the uh, discussion about the animation studio earlier where the worry was, oh my God, we have this film, it's gonna take us five years to make it, and we're spending 100, uh, 250 million bucks, and somebody's gonna leave in the middle of it, and we're gonna, you know, it's gonna be a disaster. The way to make that happen is what they're doing, which is to make people comfortable and enjoy their lives together in, in the logic of what they do. I wanna talk about this uh, idea of prosperity for a second. We've developed this logic around the engine of prosperity, which is about the kind of um, connection between the individual and the group that if that is in balance, that makes sense. Um, that the son of the founder of Herman Miller uh, once said that places of realized potential, he talked about places of realized potential, and he wanted to understand the passion and per uh, purpose of the individual, passion and purpose of the individual, and apply it and align it to the organizational pur purpose. So by doing that, one gets people working on things that have their passion and that are engaged in what they do for the business itself. The, the vertical axis of this is about, of course, every company wants to make money. They need to make money in order to survive. And uh, there's a logic about that that makes sense. Now, when one engages the heart and the uh, enthusiasm of the people at work, you automatically end up with a profit-making uh, logic, is, is the way this works. DJ Dupree, who was the founder of Herman Miller, uh, once said that uh, you should not start with the financial goals of the business, but start with the true problem and the real need. So again, putting your heart into what it is that the company is about and having people as individuals and as groups connect to each other to make the process work, you end up with a profitable business. So the, 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 we, we believe that that's a, a strong, thoughtful way to think about what work is about. Now, no one size fits all, you know, no solutions that are off the shelf actually work uh, directly as they, as they come out of the box. And what we need to strive for are optimal workplace solutions that, um, that come from the individuals who are doing the work. We believe that analyzing how people think about their job, about their company, about the work, is all about the connectedness of the individual to the business and being sure that we're really making sure that the, um, that the place can help make that a powerful equation. So um, the next big, uh, next big thing isn't for you is a way of us describing, listen, we're not here to present a solution, we're here to present a way of thinking about this for the, for the future. Now, one of the ways we're doing that is we're talking about modes of work. And uh, we have concluded that there are 10 modes of work, that these are, um, the three of them are solitary work, and seven of them are connected work. Now, uh, by the way, so you're, you don't have to write all this down, there's, there are a couple of, uh, there's a magazine back in the back that describes this, please take one, and it, it'll give you the, the logic of this a little bit deeper. But the idea is that these settings uh, in the context of the kind of work and development that we talked about a few minutes ago will make things happen within companies. So one of the ones that's on here is warm up, cool down, which is kind of logical that before a big meeting, you get together and you warm up, you, get, you decide who's gonna say what, and there's a logic. What if that were a place and a setting within the context of the office that allowed you to do that in a way that really made it make sense. 
And on the other hand, cool down is the time after the meeting where you dissect what did he really mean when he said that? What is the logic of where we're going? Who's got the next step? What's it about? So that's, that's what those are about. Those are connected then to settings, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, but the settings are the individual kinds of workplaces that relate to those modes of work. And we, um, and I am so not gonna go into this because you're really not gonna be able to see it, but the idea is that there's a transition from current ways of organizing offices. So on here, the green represents havens or private offices. And the brown over on the other side represents um, uh, hives or places where multiple group, you know, groups with multiple people are uh, accomplishing their work. So the logic is if you analyze how your work is going, you might organize to go that way. Um, I'm going to wrap up here by, uh, by saying living beats dying, which I think is a given. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're on a journey, and uh, we are trying to uh, work towards the alignment of the people who work in companies with the way they work in the spaces they work. And that alignment, we think, is the key to making uh, powerful uh, decisions about motivation, creation, and interaction. We want to harness this power of individual passion and shared purpose to foster the future. Thank you very much.